Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. On Tuesday, March 22nd, a couple of explosions rocked Brussels airport, killing 11 people. Another blast struck near the European Union headquarters an hour later, leaving approximately 20 people dead in the Belgian capital. The Islamic State has taken responsibility for the attack, and two of the suicide bombers have now been identified as Belgian nationals. Here to discuss with us the recent attacks in Brussels is our guest, Chris Hedges. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and a regular columnist at Truth Dig. He's also the former Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Thanks so much for being with us, Chris. Thank you. So, Chris, this news certainly is um, dominating headlines right now, and, and many people are asking themselves, why Brussels? Well, um, I think for many of the same reasons we saw the attacks in Paris. You have a large immigrant community uh, that comes out of um, North Africa in particular. Uh, they tend to be segregated within the society. Uh, there's a heavy degree of racism, high unemployment. Um, there is a struggle for identity um, because, for instance, they may have been born in Tunisia or wherever, um, come to Belgium or France at a young age, uh, but because of the endemic European racism, don't f fit in or not treated as, as, as equals. Um, and yet when they go back, you know, they're looked upon as being French or Belgium. When you say they're not treated as equals, can you give us an example? Well, the, especially in, in French society, they're segregated into banlieues, these horrific Stalinist-type housing projects on the outside of French cities, Lyon, Paris, and other places. And um, uh, unemployment is very high. Uh, the majority of the prison population in France is of North African descent. Um, and they are easy prey because of the way European society has treated them. They're easy prey for these Islamists. Many of them have been adrift. I mean, you actually, most of them don't come out of religious households. Mm. Um, they're involved in petty crime. And for what I had read of the two suicide bombers uh, at the airport in Belgium, they had a history of petty crime. And, and then they have this kind of conversion experience where their rage is sanctified. Um, and the rage is legitimate. I mean, they have every reason to be angry at the way they've been treated. Um, and that translates into these kinds of attacks. That's the first thing. The second thing is we have to acknowledge that for the last 13 years in Iraq, 15 years in Afghanistan, we have been bombing these people night and day. We have created millions of refugees, um, over a million dead in Iraq. Um, and they don't have an air force. So if you're bombing Raqqa as we are continuously, which of course, you know, these 500,000 pound iron fragmentation bombs are hardly surgical weapons. Uh, they can take out, you know, several houses on a city block. Mm -hmm. So the collateral damage, as we call it, is quite high. So the only way that ISIS can strike back uh, is essentially through these kinds of attacks. And at, in the aftermath of these kind of, of attacks, you have folks like Hillary Clinton. Um, she's come out saying that we need more surveillance. Um, and, and Ted Cruz and, and other um, nominees. Uh, so do, do you think this type of sort of knee-jerk response is that we need surveillance? What, what, what's, what's your counter to that? Well, they're dealing with the symptom, not the cause. The cause is the U.S. military occupation of the Middle East and the brutality, and I would even call it state terror, let's include the terror of drones, um, has inflicted on huge swaths of the population. Uh, and this is a very potent recruiting tool in the hands of groups like ISIS. And the reason that they have expanded to the extent that they have. So, you know, violence, our violence, is what created these groups. If we go all the way back to the war against the Soviet Union and our empowering of ISIS and um, you know, we have created these groups, and um, what, you're, what these political figures are in essence calling for is a tactic, you know, which has uh, contributed tremendously to this kind of terrorism, i.e. violence, as the way we're going to defeat these groups. It's, it's just a complete misreading of what's 
happening on the ground in the Middle East and how complicit we are in essentially fueling these kinds of attacks. Even surveillance, um, well, drones aside. Look, I mean, you have, part of the reason that, that uh, um, this took place in Belgium, although we had, of course, a very large attack in France, but remember that attack was planned in Belgium. And well, I covered Al-Qaeda after 9-11, I was based in Paris. And the French, who have a much more sophisticated uh, internal security system than the Belgians, uh, even then, like with the, there was an attempt to blow up the, the uh, U.S. embassy in Paris, uh, and they, they broke the plot, but the, the fertilizer that was being packed inside the truck as a car bomb was in a garage in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So that's been a long tradition because the, the Belgians are just not as um, organized in terms of surveillance. Um, and so these groups can operate more freely in Belgium. So that they'll often, you know, going back to, you know, many years, they will often plan their attacks if they're carrying them out in France. They'll, they'll plan them and logistically prepare the ground in Belgium. But couldn't that be an argument that that's why you need more surveillance? You need surveillance sure, to be you more need organized. Sure, you need surveillance. Um, on the other hand, it isn't going to stop the attacks. I mean, what is it that's causing the attacks? And, you know, the, the French have a pretty good surveillance system, and yet they suffered horrific attacks in Paris. And, uh, you know, some are going to slip through. Uh, the difference between Al-Qaeda, and it's a big difference, and ISIS, is that Al-Qaeda had very few foreign fighters, I mean, from outside the Middle East. It was largely a clan-based organization. It didn't control territory the way ISIS controls certain areas of Libya and parts of Syria and Iraq. And so um, this, you know, the control of territory has seen an infusion of 20 to 30,000 foreign fighters, four to 5,000 of whom carry European passports. Mm. And as we continue to, in essence, uh, attempt to break ISIS through aerial bombardment, drones, and those kinds of things, we're not attacking them on the ground, um, that, it, number one, gives an incentive to ISIS to strike back. But because they have so many people who can integrate back into Europe, it gives them the mechanism to strike back. And that's what we've seen. And a lot of folks will see where, where do you draw the line between surveillance and civil liberties? And well, you know, we, you know, even when I lived in France, it was a police state. Um, yes, it becomes an excuse to strip us of, you know, what little, little kind of liberty we have left. I mean, we're all, whether we're Belgian or, or French or American or British, all under state surveillance that dwarfs anything ever dreamt of by the Stasi state in East Germany and these kinds of terrorist attacks. Uh, you know, uh, empower the state to take, you know, there's not much more left that they can take, but to take what's left, denial of habeas corpus, denial of due process. Uh, um, so yes, it plays to the extremes, their extreme and our extreme. Okay, Chris Hedges joining us in studio in Baltimore. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.